so what are we going to do here? Uh, the, the idea is we're going to do sort of a whirlwind tour of data privacy treated in sort of from an algorithmic perspective, namely differential privacy. Um, we're going to start, we're going to dive right in and partway through today's lecture, I'll sort of give you a little bit more background on what that means and what I'm hoping to get through over the course of the week. But the sort of the basis of today's discussion is this realization that many of today's most interesting and exciting computations are computations on personal data. So how does Facebook decide what to show you next? How do the ads that you see online get chosen? How do you get driving directions, movie recommendations? How's it decided whether you get a loan or you get into grad school? Or how do we decide if new medications and medical treatments work? All of these are questions that are incredibly important to our day-to-day -day lives. And they're questions that are being answered on personal data of various sorts. And what's the problem with this that we're concerned about today? Well, the problem is that in many cases, this is potentially sort of sensitive personal data. So the running example that I use um, for a lot of this week is think about a database of medical data. Think about it as you have a bunch of people in the database. Think of each person as being a row there. And all the columns are just different pieces of medical data about them, tests that were run on them, uh, diagnoses from their doctors, things they reported on questionnaires, all that, things that were measured. All of these things are columns on the database. And we're gonna think about a hospital that holds a rich medical database. Uh, what if, what if a hospital wants to be able to share that medical data with researchers? For example, they'd like to be able to use an, an outside research team to help them understand what's going on locally with COVID cases. What are the precautions that that hospital should take? You know, ideally we would imagine that we would live in a world where somehow it would be possible for the hospital to kind of fuzz the data, come up with a safe version of the data and hand that to researchers. Is that possible? If so, what does it mean? Um, I could think of even sort of a simpler setting um, that that sounded kind of challenging. Suppose the hospital just wants to be able to release some sort of aggregate trends or some statistics about its patients. When is that okay? When is that an acceptable thing to do? When might that be risky for personal privacy or is that ever risky for personal privacy? Or if you wanna think about something maybe a little bit more sort of far-fetched or or sort of uh, abstract, I, the hospital potentially also wants to make complex decisions on the basis of the data that they hold about individuals. They wanna that, use that data to revise their, their treatment plan for new COVID patients. They wanna use that data as the basis of where they're gonna locate some, some outreach facilities for a particular disease. Um, if the basis of any of these decisions is individual, personal, potentially sensitive information, do we have to worry that the decisions that we make are somehow revealing of the personal data? And if so, when and how, and can we prevent that? Or even just to sort of boil it down to the simplest possible example, suppose that all the hospital wants to do is release one statistic, like what percentage of COVID patients who were admitted to the hospital uh, needed ventilation. Surely a single statistic ought to be fairly benign. Or is it? And how do you know? And what does it mean for that to be okay? And that's the sort of language that we're hoping to, to develop over the course of these next couple of days, some way of thinking about these types of questions. So it doesn't take too much convincing um, to, these days to sort of get you to the point where you realize that an incredible amount of data about each of us is being gathered and used continuously as we're talking right now. Um, I think of it as each of us walks through our lives with a cloud of data over our heads and that cloud is just getting richer with every passing moment. You know, in the olden days, it was data from our, you know, magazine subscriptions and it was these cards that we used to carry around attached to our keychains that gave us discounts at various stores. But now they're the div digital equivalents of all of these. We have all of the data related to our purchasing behavior. We have relationships with various government entities um, that gather information, uh, information about us. 
Um, if you receive healthcare through a doctor or through a hospital system, they've got rich data about you. If you have health insurance or other forms of insurance, they know a lot about you. If you use the internet, you know, Gmail, search for things, use social media, all of these sites and more and more and more and more are gathering these rich profiles about all of this and making use of them in various ways. And a lot of the potential uses of personal data today are really cool um, and amazing and powerful. Um, so we can use this sort of broad statistical uh, information about people to help us understand um, underlying phenomena, things like genotype phenotype associations in a population, or we can learn better ways of uh, making predictions about medical outcomes or treating uh, various conditions better. Um, we can use this rich data to give us better insights, aggregate statistics, other types of predictions. Um, we can use it to, to notice when something changes, for example, an intrusion detection system or a disease outbreak monitoring system. Um, and we can also use it for just this rich, rich array of modern data mining and learning types of tasks. Basically, personal data is used as the basis of every company's you know, behavior at all times these days. You know, how they're pricing, what they're selling, what they're showing at every moment is on the basis of past uh, consumer data. Um, and all of those strategies are being continuously updated. And so we can do amazing things. If you're somebody who's interested in humans and human behavior um, and making the, better, the world a better place, you see all these amazing opportunities in all of this personal data. Um, but we have these lingering concerns about privacy and what privacy might mean or should mean, or when should we be concerned about it in this space. Um, so the plan for today is we're gonna try to get our hands on a formal notion of privacy. That's gonna be the basis of our discussion for the week. Um, and then once we've gotten there, I'm gonna just tell you a little bit more about where we're going um, over the course of the week. Um, and I'm gonna be flexible. If you guys wanna ask a lot of questions, I can slow things down, that's great. Don't hesitate to interrupt. I don't know if you have the ability to interrupt yourself with a mic, um, but you can type questions in the chat. If anybody sees a question and I'm not noticing it, it's because I'm just trying to look at too many things at once. Please, somebody stop me. Um, make me answer questions as we go along. That's fine. I have plenty more to tell you about than there I could possibly fit into this week. So let's just fit in whatever makes sense. Um, I'll try to get to a few things that I think are particularly important for you to understand, to be able to go out and read more in this literature um, and to sort of have a sense of what's going on with differential privacy. Um, but if there's something in particular that I don't, that I wanted to get to that I don't get to, that's, that's not so bad. Better to answer a question along the way. Um, and then today, if we have some more time at the end, after we talk through the course goals, I'd like to start to, to give you some of the mathematical properties that make differential privacy an appealing notion. And the one, the one that sort of emerged as the, the primary math, mathematical notion of data privacy. Okay, um, so the first thing that I wanna do is I was just talking before we started about how much I like breakout rooms in Zoom. I believe I have the ability to put you in, oh, I do not have the ability to put you into breakout rooms. Does anybody have the ability to put you guys into breakout rooms? Anybody know? Oh, sorry. I, I... So Jose, can, can you check if you have the ability to send people to breakout rooms? Don't do it yet. I just want to know if it's an option. Uh, yes, I, I, I can. Sure. Okay. Sure, can. Are you willing to, to give it a shot? Uh, I, I'm not 100% sure how this, I mean, I've used it at some point, but. <laughs> okay. So, and so here, let me tell you the idea and then let's see if we can make this work uh, because I think it's good to sort of get us all thinking together a little bit. So what I'd like you to do, if this breakout thing works, is to spend a couple of minutes talking to three or four other people about what analyses on a database might violate privacy. So what are things you might do? And you can think again about this hospital database. What are the things that a hospital might do with that database that might be problematic privacy-wise? Privacy and what are analyses that sound like they're okay privacy-wise? Um, and so I'd like you to just say, hi, this is who I am, and to talk about that for two minutes in these breakout rooms, if the breakout rooms will work. Let's give it a shot. Let's so can you will, see if you can send it. us into groups of like, you know, four people or so? Okay, um, yes, I will 
do that. Okay. Um, so, ah, okay. Just give me one sec because six or something, no? Five or six. Um, sign automatically. Yeah. Oh, okay. There we go. Oh, it opened the rooms. All right. Looks like it's working. All right. All right. So everybody accept your invitation and you only got a couple minutes. So I'm actually not going to join my group that I'm being sent to. Yeah. I think hang out I here. Also hang out. Hang out here. Yeah. Yeah. I, okay. I used this at some point. I just had issues by going into a room and coming back out. So I think I, if I don't do that, <laughs> things should be fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Something I think something about that changed at some point in, in Zoom's implementation. Ah, okay. um, yeah, I, for a while it worked really well. I was teaching and I was bouncing in and out of all of the rooms. Um, and then at some point something changed. Maybe maybe that was a moment when it broke for you too. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I don't know if it makes a difference because I use it in Linux. That that's also maybe maybe who knows. <laughs> Who knows exactly? <laughs> okay, yeah. but it seems like most people joined. Yeah. Okay. That's that's good. I'll give them a minute. That, the the hardest part of using breakout rooms is if you're not in the rooms, it's very hard to like give yourself the sense of how long is it going to take people to talk to each other. And I always bring them back at the wrong moment, but that's okay. <laughs> um, so I think that to close them, it, it takes a while, right? If you, it takes one minute, yeah. One minute. So, so they get a one minute warning before they get automatically kicked back in. So we can probably give them another 30 seconds and then kick them back in. Okay, okay, cool. Somebody that was not assigned that way. Oh yeah, so if, yeah. if people get kicked out of the Zoom and then they come back in, you have to sometimes pop them back into one of the groups so you can throw, yeah. throw them into Maybe something. I will just do that yeah all right okay that's good i like this i mean this makes the the, the lecture much more uh, interactive I, I love this it's well it's instead of actually talking i mean it, usually when i give a lecture like this i have people talk to their neighbor i have people ask questions and there's right. interaction and it, you kind of miss that when you're staring at a screen so some yeah, attempt exactly. to get get some of that back okay we can bring them on back okay Sorry, I was alone in my outbreak. Moment. Jose, I don't know oh, if no. he was only me. I was, I, was waiting, I was waiting for someone to come, but uh, no one came. So. <laughs> Uh, apologize to anybody who got stuck by themselves i hope you had a really oh, good I'm, yeah that was probably my bad i'm sorry <laughs> no no it, it's fine i was just I worried that it was purpose, for everyone it on purpose. send me twice to a broadway outbreak room with uh, with only with myself with only... <laughs> no <laughs> sorry it was not the, it was not on purpose <laughs> Okay, I, I get the sense though that other people weren't stuck by themselves because they're not rushing back in. So ah, that's, yeah, that's always no, a good I, sign. <laughs> there were, but Matthias and oh well, yeah, it was just unlucky. Yeah. Couple of people. Okay, five seconds to get everybody back. Perfect. All right. Okay, I think everybody is filtering back into the room. Welcome back. Um, I know that wasn't a lot of time to chat, but um, any ideas? What are some things that sounded like a problem for privacy, but you might be interested in doing on a data set? Anybody want to speak up? Mention something that came up in your group? Hi, I guess just to break the ice, something that would be like clearly problematic would be just uh, uh, being able to query uh, 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 like, oh, which, what, what are the people that had some kind of disease and just list these people like this, like, I guess like this is just the extreme case, but like this is clearly pr problematic, but it would be interesting. Some people would be interested in just finding a, a, a system that has this kind of query available for them. Yeah, it's actually, you know, from a medical research perspective would be totally reasonable. Let me filter this database to just show me the people who have this you know, disease because I want to do more with it, their data. But from a privacy perspective, this is potentially really problematic. So it's somehow, it's somehow that we got back the names of certain people who had a certain property feels, feels troubling. Yeah. Anything else that seemed troubling to you guys? I um I feel like if you if you could um maybe like reveal some statistics, uh it might not 
uh, be like that uh, problematic. But if you could somehow like correlate it with with other uh, with with some other database, like some public information, mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. maybe you could make inferences about like a specific person. Maybe you have the name of a person in a public database, and I don't know with his age or her age or whatever. And then maybe like you can infer like make inferences with the information revealed by some like statistic statistic of a private database and maybe like you could uh obtain uh risk information about that person yeah yeah so there are a lot of really important points in what you just said so first of all you said it kind of feels like some aggregate statistics might be okay um and we'll play some more with that idea Um, And the second thing you said was this concern about outside information. In particular, you highlighted this concern about linkage attacks. So even if I do something that looks pretty benign over here on this data set, I might worry there might be some other data set out there such that it has just the right information to figure out who is who in that that sort of benign looking analysis that I did. And for, you know, if you, if you have sort of an ad hoc approach to privacy where you don't have formal guarantees, these kinds of linkage attacks basically always come to haunt you. Um, because we don't have a lot of time together this week, I probably won't talk a lot about attacks on other notions of privacy, but if anybody's interested, you can send me an email, I can give you some pointers, I can organize some references for you guys. But a really, really common phenomenon are these linkage attacks where somebody does something that they sort of cross their fingers and hope produ- uh, preserves privacy, you know, they, they take off all the sensitive looking attributes and leave the things that look benign. Um, and then somebody comes along later on with some outside data source and lines it up and they manage to figure out who's who. Um, so that kind of thing is called a linkage attack. Yeah, anything else that, that you guys talked about that seemed particularly okay or particularly not okay in terms of analyses on a data set? So maybe if there is some randomization in the collection of data, for example, the health uh, one. So if hospitals give data, but they don't uh, necessarily disclose the location of the people. And I mean, if it's like multi-country study or something, but the researchers don't exactly know from where the uh, data is coming, then probably it's a little more uh, privacy preserving. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So the idea that somehow some sort of randomness or uncertainty might play a role, I think, is, is really key. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good insight. So one of the things that you guys probably ran into as I, you, as I was trying to, you know, have you think about this, is it's not quite clear what it is that we're promising about an analysis. Like, what makes it okay? What does it mean for it to be okay? Um, and so you maybe played through in your discussions a little bit of sort of exploration of, you know, what might we promise to people in this data set um, that would maybe make what we're doing okay. And one thing that maybe some of you explored is this idea that maybe what we could do is we could delete all the identifying information. Um, and this, at least in some countries, Um, is a sort of legally recognized technique for preserving privacy. So in the context of the United States, in the context of health data, there are particular categories of information that are considered to be risky in identifying, um, like your ID number and your name. Um, And if you want to make data privacy preserving, you have to delete those identifying fields from the data set. Well, now, as we just discussed, some things can go wrong with that. And everybody who works in privacy, I think has their sort of their favorite example of privacy gone wrong. Um, Mine's really old, but it's really good. So so my favorite example is back in August of 2006, uh, there was this company called AOL. They had a search engine. Um, and it was a pretty big deal at the time. I, I, and AOL research with very, very good intentions, I decided to share with the research community some search logs, uh, because at the time search logs were just simply not available. Nobody knew what search histories looked like at the time, unless you actually worked at AOL. Um, so what they did was they released about 20 million search keywords paired with anonymized user IDs um, for over half a million users over a three month period. So basically they released 
anonymized versions of their search logs to the research community, I mean, to the public. Um, and you can kind of imagine what might have happened next. And if you want to Google up or AOL search up a phrase like AOL search debacle, you can get the whole story and the whole drama. Um, so what happened? Well, in the words of the, the folks doing the release, no personally identifiable information was released in the search logs. So no, they didn't take my search logs combined with my name or my email address and, you know, list out every single search keyword that I'd used over this period of time alongside my name. No, they replaced my name in this log with a random user ID. So it wasn't Katrina Liggett and all of my search keywords. It was user blah, 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 and all my search keywords. Now, what can go wrong with that? Well, not surprisingly, as we all know today, self-searching on identifying information is incredibly common. People self-search on their name. Okay, maybe they managed to suppress the names. They self-search on their address, their, the town they live in, their social security number, um, other sort of private information very often makes it into individual searches because when you're searching, you don't think there's somebody looking over your shoulder. You feel like you're doing that in the privacy of your own home. But it turned out, um, not surprisingly, that a good number of these search logs were re-identifiable and were re-identified very quickly. Two days after the re release of the information, somebody's picture was on you know, the front of the New York Times. Um, her search logs had been uh, re-identified very quickly by a reporter, um, but honestly, that lots of people were re-identifiable. Re and if you enjoy the exercise of trying to re-identify people in data, well, surprise, surprise, even though ALL search immediately took down the data, you can still find it. Um, because once it's out there, it's out there forever. Um, so if you want to, you can go and you can download all of these search logs. There's some very interesting people with some very questionable interests uh, represented in that set and you can go and enjoy it. Um, so what are the lessons here? Sort of one lesson to take is that even when the release here was incredibly well-intentioned, this was not hackers hacking into the database. This was, you know, respected, well-intentioned researchers trying to make data available to other researchers. They were trying to do the right thing. They thought they weren't releasing any personally identifiable information, but because they had no provable guarantees on what they were doing, it was very risky. Um, and what they saw was once that data was out there, there was no way to take it back. So ad hoc risk solutions are super risky because basically you're never gonna be able to sleep well at night because someday something's gonna go wrong and then there's nothing you can do to un undo your mistakes. The, to look on the positive side, sort of the glass half full side of things, there's a huge opportunity here for formalism, for thinking about, you know, what could we, what could we do that would come with a proof? Okay, so let's return to this question. What do we want to promise to people whose data appears in a database? Um, and we're going to do some computation on it. So we thought about deleting identifying information. We realized, hey, maybe not. Um, the, and you know, you think you might be more clever than AOL was. You think you might be able to find all the, the fields that you would need to suppress or the fields that you would need to, to sort of delete or distort in some way. But honestly, you can't know when, what other outside information is out there. And, you, and since you can't know that about your adversary or you can't know what outside information is going to be, be available in five or 10 or 15 years, there's really nothing you can do of this in this vein that's going to be safe. So what should you promise? So we could go back to one of those suggestions that we had from one of you guys, um, which is maybe we can somehow ask questions that pertain not to individuals, but to large populations, sort of aggregate statistic, statistics. Okay, so let me give you a hint as to why this can already start to, to be a problem. So one reason that aggregate statistics could be a problem is imagine we ran the following experiment. It's easier to visualize if we were all in a room together instead of all in a Zoom together. But so suppose we're, you know, a bunch of us are in a room together and we decide um, in some way to find out the 
average, say, grade point average of all of the students in the room. So everybody writes down their, their grade point average on a piece of paper, we put them all in a hat, and then somebody, you know, averages the result and announces it. You know, the average in this room is 84.3, okay? It's pretty, pretty benign, right? But then somebody was late to lecture. They walk in the room, they have no idea what we've done so far and why there's 84.3 on the whiteboard. And we say, okay, we're gonna run a fun experiment. Let's find out the average grade point average in the room. Everybody write yours down on a piece of paper, put them all in a hat and let's calculate the average. What's gonna happen now? What does the average reveal? The person's GPA who came late. Exactly. So we did this differencing attack. So we did this one sort of aggregate statistic that looked pretty benign. We did this other aggregate statistic that looked pretty benign and oops, you combine them together and all privacy goes out the window. So that's not so good. But this problem of combining different sort of aggregate statistics together is not just this sort of corner case um, that only comes up if you do crazy experiments with people, you know, one person entering and leaving the room. This is a problem that's actually pervasive in settings where you wanna ask or answer a lot of aggregate statistics about even a very, very large data set. So this is something that's come up in the context of the US Census. So what's the census? Basically every 10 years, by law, the United States has to go around and collect a certain amount of information about every single resident of the country. Um, and then they make information about that population available for a wide variety of important purposes, including it's the basis of uh, allocation decisions of various resources, um, as the basis of allocations of um, voting uh, weights in terms of voting. They, this is used widely for all sorts of research um, and is generally made available to the public. Um, so there's, the US is required to do this information gathering and release all sorts of statistics about the population. And these are, you know, it's a big population, pretty aggregate statistics. We're talking, you know, 300 and something million people. Um, at the same time, the census quite nicely is prohibited from re releasing any information for which the data furnished by any particular establishment or individual can be identified. So basically they're required to, to release a bunch of aggregates. They're required also not to re-identify people or make that possible. Um, so for example, in the 2010 census, there were 308 million people who were represented in the census data gathering. That's a lot of work. Um, and over the course of the, the past decade, on the basis of that census information, about 7.8 billion aggregate statistics have been released. So lots and lots of specific questions about, you know, how many people, you know, in this region of the country with the following properties, blah, 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 blah. All of these pretty aggregate, pretty benign looking statistics. Um, but you might worry that together they might somehow cause a problem. So historically, what has the census done to protect privacy? Well, actually, historically, it's been a secret what the census does to protect privacy. They've done various forms of swapping of entries, masking of outliers, binning of ranges. Um, and it's like there are only a handful of people who actually know the details of how it's been done in any given year, because part of how it's supposed to work is by keeping the details a secret. Well, turns out even the secret didn't really work out so well. Um, so recently, the census ran its own reconstruction attack on the 2010 census releases. So basically what they did is they took all of the data about the 2010 census that was made public, so all of these benign looking aggregate statistics, and they, you can think of it as basically each of those aggregate statistics is putting some constraint on what the underlying database could have been. So basically you're getting a big mathematical program um, you know, depending on what the constraints look like, you think it's like a big linear program. Um, and what you then do is you just solve for the underlying database of people in the United States as constrained by the answers to the various queries. Um, and then that lets you sort of guess the data of all the people and you can then link up that guess with publicly available data in an attempt to re-identify people. And then they checked their success rate of this attack against the actual census data. And because it was the census running the attack, they could actually check the success rate of the attack. Um, and what they learned 
is that they actually had confirmed re-identifications on 17% of the population, and they cor correctly reconstructed the block, which is a pretty small ge geographic area, sex, age, race, ethnicity, and age plus or minus one year on 71% of the population. That's an incredibly successful reconstruction attack. So even the US Census, you know, with all the world's experts on data privacy, doing the best they could with very good intention, their approaches to privacy didn't work. Okay, so back to the drawing board. What do we wanna promise? Well, what if we could somehow promise that, okay, this, this large population thing didn't quite work, but it felt like it was going in the right direction. What if we could promise that if somebody had access to the results of our computation, that they wouldn't learn anything about anyone as a result of having that access. So they wouldn't have learned anything about anyone that they wouldn't have learned had we not released whatever this was, an aggregate statistic or some, some noisy data. So there are a few, few too many words, few too many quanti quantifiers in this sentence. But the idea is that somehow, what if we could promise that our computations aren't revealing anything about anybody? So, okay, first question, is such a guarantee possible? One answer is, yeah, well, obviously, yes, this is possible. We could just output garbage at all times. You know, that certainly is gonna satisfy this de definition. And this hits to something that's gonna be an important theme for us, which is that it's gonna be universally true that getting privacy without usefulness is easy and getting usefulness without privacy is easy. The interesting question is always going to be, can I get a meaningful trade-off between privacy and usefulness? And that's where this notion starts to look problematic. So sure, you can achieve this notion, but it's gonna turn out that this is gonna constrain us from really learning anything useful at all. And we, we don't want that to be the result. We want to still get something useful out of the data set. So this anything was somehow too strong. So what if we step back a little bit from the strength of that previous statement and weaken it in the following way? What if we said that access to the output of my computation shouldn't let anybody learn much more about anybody than they could have learned had we run the same analysis omitting that individual from the database. Okay, again, a lot of words, a lot of quantifiers. What does this mean? The idea is that what if I could imagine two worlds, one where the database has you and the other data where the database doesn't have you. If I learn about the, about the same things about you and about the world in those two experiments, then your data wasn't very important. Your data wasn't very revealing. And maybe I can think of that as a notion of privacy. So intuitively, um, if I wanted to, to ensure this, what I'd have to do is I'd have sort of have to take the, the true computation that I wanted to do, say computing some statistic on the underlying data set, and I'm gonna have to randomize its behavior a little bit because I need it to behave kind of the same on nearby data sets. So, you know, instead of answering the correct answer, you know, 18%, what I'll do is I'll do some randomization. I'll sample from some distribution that's hopefully you know, pretty weighted close to 18%. And the interpretation of the promise in this context is if we could give a guarantee like this, it would be a promise to each individual that if you participate in the experiment or if you decide to leave the database, it doesn't really make that much difference. No outcome will change probability by very much. And if we could get a guarantee like this, you can already start to see that it has sort of an, in, an interpretation in terms of incentives. It says to you as an individual, hey, you might as well participate in my computation because I'm gonna learn about the same thing, no matter whether you're in or whether you're out of the database. Okay, so this was all very, very vague and took us a long time to get there. Let's try to make this a little bit more concrete and mathematical. So the, the language that we're gonna be using um, in the coming days is we'll have some universe of possible database entries, which will look like a scripty X. Um, and we'll think about a database as consisting of a collection of such rows, so a collection of elements of the scripty X. Um, and one way to represent 
a database, this collection of rows, is just for each possible row, each you know, entry that could have existed in a database, I'm going to indicate how many copies of that entry are present in my database. So this is going to be a very, very empty looking histogram that says, nope, nobody with this particular set of entries. Nope, nobody with this particular set of entries. Nope, nobody with this particular set of entries. Oh, one with this particular set of, uh, of entries and so on and so forth. So you can think of this as an enormous histogram. This is just notation. You obviously would not carry around this representation and implementation in any world. Okay, now that's what a database is. What we wanna do is we wanna do some computation on a database. And like we wanna think very generally about what a computation means. So maybe we wanna fit a model, maybe we wanna compute a statistic, maybe we wanna share sanitized data. And we wanna give some sort of guarantee of privacy formally that sort of echoes this intuition that we've been trying to build up here. And in order to, to echo that intuition that we've been building up, what we want is somehow for the computation that we do to mask small changes in the underlying data set, to hide small changes in the underlying data set. So we're gonna need some notion of a small change. And the notion of small change that we'll use um, for the purposes of this week is to say that we're gonna require nearly identical behavior of our mechanism or of our computation on databases that differ by the addition or removal of a single row. So if I were to take a database and add or remove someone for that database, the computation should behave almost exactly the same way. And so now that we have a notion of neighboring databases, just adding or removing somebody, now we can build this up to a formal mathematical notion. Um, this is the notion of differential privacy that grew out of work of Dinor and Nassim in 2003, to work with Nassim, McSherry, and Smith in 2006, um, and first appeared sort of in this formulation under this name in a paper of Dwork 2006. Um, but the, the, the core notion is really uh, DNMS 2006. Um, so differential privacy is an epsilon parametrized notion. So we talk about epsilon differential privacy. And it's a property of an algorithm. It's a property of a function that maps from database space to output space. And it restricts the behavior of that mapping of that function of that algorithm in a certain way. It restricts that algorithm such that for any two neighboring data sets, remember that just means that they differ in the addition or removal of a single row. We, we say that the algorithm needs to behave almost exactly the same way. And how do we formalize this mathematically? Well, we say for any subset of the outcome space that you might be interested in, the probability that the, that the algorithm is gonna map this database into that outcome space is multiplicatively very, very close to the probability that the algorithm is gonna map this neighboring database into that outcome space. So one way to think about it is if you sort of map the probability mass um, that this algorithm induces on each possible outcome under database X, versus under database uh, Y that's a neighbor, those probability distributions need to look very, very close in this multiplicative sense. And if you know this E to the epsilon thing looks weird, what is it? It's just an E to the epsilon parameter. So epsilon is that parameter that's controlling the privacy. Okay, so you know if, if it's hard for you to think about an E to the epsilon, we're talking about small numbers, think about it as a multiplicative one plus epsilon factor, okay? So the idea is that as I turn this epsilon knob, it controls how similarly the algorithm needs to behave on any two neighboring databases. Okay, so is big epsilon good for privacy or bad for privacy? Good. So big epsilon, <laughs> means that the behavior is allowed to be more different on the neighboring databases. You're less constrained and there's more change that you're allowed to make visible when I move from one database to a neighboring database. So it's actually bad for privacy because you're less constrained. When you have a small epsilon, your behavior is more constrained and you have to do nearly exactly the same thing on neighboring databases. So small epsilons are actually good. I asked because it's a trick question. It's, it goes the opposite direction of how you think it's supposed to go. Okay, so it takes a little while to get sort of your footing and working with this definition. So I'm gonna kind of repeat, keep repeating myself over and over again um, as we get comfortable with this definition in various ways. You can think of this definition as saying, 
Um, like we said before, if we want to run a computation on a database, um, Katina, we... yeah, sorry go ahead. to interrupt. There are a few, there are a few questions in the chat. Maybe. Sure. Yeah. Sorry. I'm not monitoring the chat. Actually. I, do you mind reading me a couple of questions and I'll go back and, and cover yeah, them? So Cristobal is, question, is asking uh, whether does the probability space that generates the database plays any role in this definition? Great. Yeah. So, um, so basically, I'll, I'll say a few things about that. So one thing that I want to say is we make no assumptions on the data distribution. We want the, to get a guarantee of differential privacy, um, regardless of the underlying data distribution. Um, and that's going to be really essential. It's, you can see this is sort of a paranoid definition in a number of ways. It's sort of worst case in, in a number of ways. And one of them is making no assumptions about the data distribution. One thing that is going to be uh, useful in sort of how we think about things is let's just keep our lives easy and actually imagine that everything is discrete. So we have a discrete set of possible database entries. We have a discrete space of outcomes of the mechanisms. I'll fudge the discreteness at various points potentially, but the mental model that you should have is that everything is discrete and so you don't have to think anything about anything tricky in terms of probabilities. Okay. And, and there's another question. Uh, somebody, Ma Matthews is asking what happens if S is a singleton? So it's M of X one. That is a great question and actually anticipates one of the directions that I'm gonna ask you to look at in the homework set. Um, so if S is a singleton, this still needs to hold. Um, so we're constrained to put, the same probability mass, except differing by this multiplicative factor on every possible outcome. And in fact, um, what you will see as you uh, look at the homework is for this version of differential privacy, only making that constraint on the singletons is actually equivalent to the constraint as I've written it here. But in a moment, I'm about to relax this notion of differential privacy. And then just making this constraint on the singletons will not be equivalent. Um, so it's something that actually, it's a really good point and something to pay attention to. Okay, and, and there's one last question. Uh, like Bernardo is asking whether it would be different if you define the, uh, the notion as by taking the difference of the two probabilities in the inequalities would be less than epsilon. Yes, so, so it is actually going to be Im important um, the, that we're talking about um, multiplicative factors um, instead of having it be sort of, I guess sort of in some sense normalized in, in the way that you're describing. Um, and that's, I think that's a, that's a good sort of alternative world to carry in the back of your head as we go forward and think about um, what might look different if you were to, if you were to define things differently. Thanks. That Great. Was... Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for the questions. I apologize that I'm not watching the chat as I go. I just am not good at tracking multiple things at once. So please um, do interrupt. And I, I do want to cover all the questions. Okay. We started a few minutes late. Can I take another five minutes to, to yeah. sort of get, get to where I'm going here? Sure. Perfect. Sure. Okay. Great. Okay. So we have this notion of differential privacy. The intuition is this constraint um, behavior needing to be similar under similar databases. Um, and so one way to interpret this constraint is think from the perspective of an individual and you're trying to decide whether or not to allow your data to be used in a computation that's going to be done with a guarantee of differential privacy. Now you might think, oh, you know, it's this, it's this computation and relates to COVID and medical data. And, you know, it sounds like maybe they're gonna make some discovery that people like me are you know, much more vulnerable. I'm worried about what the consequences are gonna be. Maybe my insurance company will no longer insure me. Um, maybe people will you know, discriminate against my children. Who knows what's gonna happen? Something terrible might happen as a result of this study. So there, I can think of it as there's some bad future worlds that I might uh, end up in as a result of this study. And there's some you know, okay future worlds. What differential privacy tells you is that it actually gives you a way to reason about this situation. And what it says is that the probability that you'll end up in a bad future world is almost exactly the same, regardless of whether you withhold your data from the computation. Um, and that's actually a really powerful thing if you think about it from the perspective of this individual and their reasoning about whether or not to participate. So I promised you a relaxation of the notion of differential privacy. Here it is. So up until now, we required our behavior to be um, multiplicatively almost exactly the same on every subset of, of outcomes under two, any two neighboring databases. 
So now we're going to add an additional parameter. So before we just had this epsilon, which is controlling the multiplicative factor, this e to the epsilon. Now we have a delta two. And the delta is a small additive uh, allowance that we give ourselves. So we're allowed to differ not just multiplicatively, but also with a tiny delta probability. And I want you to think of this delta as sort of cryptographically small. This is an event that's basically never going to happen in our lifetimes. Um, but this relaxation, despite the fact that it's never actually going to happen, ends up being useful for us um, for sort of a variety of practical reasons. Um, and we can sometimes get some better trade-offs between privacy and accuracy if we allow ourselves this delta. But it's important to note that this is actually sort of a meaningfully different notion than when we didn't have the delta around. And in particular, when we were talking about epsilon differential privacy or epsilon comma zero differential privacy, if some outcome is possible under some database, then it must be possible under all databases because we can sort of chain together a, a series of additions and removals of, of people to get from this database to that database. And we're only allowed to change our probability of the outcome by multiplicative factors. So if here, if it's non-zero, then here it has to be non-zero. It might be big, it might be small, but they're both non-zero. Similarly, if it's zero probability of this outcome under this database, it has to be zero probability of that outcome under any other database, okay? And what this means in some sense is under epsilon differential privacy, you'll never have a red flag. You'll never have an outcome that says, says to you, definitely this was the input or definitely this wasn't the input. But under epsilon delta differential privacy, it is possible to have such a red flag. And so it's, I think, a, a meaningfully really different uh, guarantee, even if that delta is really tiny. OK, so what's so cool about differential privacy? Um, what's so cool about it in some sense is the fact that it's a property of the mechanism. It's a property of the function. Differential privacy is not a property of a statistic. It's not a property of a sanitized data set. It's a property of the procedure that produced that statistic or the procedure that produce, produced that sanitized data set. And because we're talking about a property of the mechanism, we all of a sudden get ourselves into a very, very different world of how we think about privacy guarantees and what we're, um, what we're able to promise. So all of a sudden, differential privacy gives you this guarantee that's unaffected by outside information. You notice in the definition of differential privacy, we didn't say anything about an attacker. We didn't say anything about what the attacker is going to do, what the attacker's powers are, the computational powers, what information the attacker had access to. We got ourselves entirely out of the business of modeling the attacker. And instead, the comparison that we make is the computation with you versus the computation without you. And Yes, it's true. Maybe the computation without you is still really problematic because it, you're going to be able to link that up with some outside in additional information and reveal something that nobody likes you revealing. Differential privacy in that case won't, won't give you any sort of protection against that harm. What it says is the bad things that will happen without you are almost exactly the same bad things that will happen if you were to participate in the computation. Um, so since we're running short on time, I will just say, okay, we have this notion, now what? What we're going to see in the coming lectures is this is an achievable notion. It's an, a notion that's actually um, gotten traction in the real world. Um, if you, you know, used Google Chrome or used an iPhone, you've used differential privacy. Um, if you I know anybody who lives in the US, the US Census uh, statistical releases are going to be subject to differential privacy for the 2020 census. Um, so it's, yes, it's, it is achievable, it is being used. Um, and what the plan is, um, is basically we're, we're trying to get ourselves this week, we can't do a survey of the literature on differential privacy, but we're trying to get ourselves to the point where you can start to get a sense of, of what it looks like and how this, this field um, operates, what are the types of questions that get asked in this space, um, and you'll be sort of ready to go off and learn more if you're interested in doing so. Um, so already today we've gotten to this question of what is privacy, how should we define it, and what we'll be trying to understand is sort of what are the trade-offs that this um, that this notion of privacy elucidates for us. And there are some fundamental trade-offs between accuracy and protecting people's personal information. And what I like about this field is really, um, I'm able to expose you to an active area of research. I mean, everything I'm talking about here is stuff that's happened in less than the past 20 years. 
Um, we, because we only have a few days together, we can't quite get to the forefront of the research, but you're not going to be that far from it. Um, you're going to be, you know, at the end of this week, able to be, you know, going and reading and understanding things that are actively going on in the differential privacy literature. And because it's new and young, there's a lot of unanswered questions still. There is, you know, room to ask the right questions, to ask a new question, to ask, you know, to propose a variant of a model. And there are tons of connections to tons of fields. And that's something, because this is such a short course, you're not going to get to experience a lot of those connections. But basically, like, pick your favorite you know, sub-discipline of theoretical computer science or even math more broadly, you could probably find a connection to differential privacy somehow. It's just very, very highly connected in, in lots of interesting ways. Um, and it's a real problem with real, real world motivation. So given the time, I'm going to stop right there. And thank you. Look forward to, to continuing tomorrow.